Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Film Frauds. And myself, Matt, and my two go hosts, Mark. Hello. And Tyler. Hello. Provide our completely unprofessional, 100% biased opinions on the movies of today, tomorrow, and yesteryear. Today, Tyler, we are doing something that we do every month. And what is that? So, we watch a lot of movies, read a lot of books, play a lot of games, do a well, lot of Well, some of us drugs. read a lot of books. Some of us read a lot of books. Um, me and Mark, clearly, because we're the only ones who display our vast literary knowledge. And don't quiz me on any of the books you can see here, please. <laughs> do not ask me anything about them. Quiz me. Quiz me. Uh, yeah, so we do a lot of that stuff. So at the end of each month, we thought we'd come together and recommend five of the stuff that we kind of were exposed to for the first time that month. Or if we don't have enough, just five recommendations in general. But I, I try to keep it to at least the month of September. So we each go. Everything we're one. reading, listening to, inserting, swallowing. Swallowing. <laughs> fighting. <laughs> stabbing. I already, made, I already made the drugs what joke. that We have to keep the drug. We have to actually get, when we do merch for film frauds, we should have that, what we're doing this month. Like yeah. Inserting drugs. Yeah. All that stuff. All right, Mark, what's your first recommendation of the month? Uh, I've already talked about this before uh, this month, but I'll just talk about it now real quick, is uh, Nashville, Robert Altman, um, 1975. It's a long movie. It's two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, I, I got the Criterion disc because I've heard so much about it. It's like the darling of the Criterion fandom, and uh, it lives up to the hype. It is an unconventional plot. It follows a bunch. It's like, sort of like Magnolia and Boogie Nights. So many characters are all very endearing or you, you know, you care to them, care for them to a certain extent. And it's just movie magic. You know, when you watch something and you're just like, wow, I'm just so glad that this exists and somebody out there created this for me to watch right now. That's, that's basically how you feel throughout the entirety of this movie. It takes a bit to win you over, but, um, uh, it's, it's just, it's incredible. It's all takes place in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, there's a, it's a political movie. There's like a political rally that's going on. There's political candidates and um, just the relationships between people. And it's, it's magical. So highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend. Awesome. So I have a movie um, that I, technically I watched late in August, like August 30th. I'm going I'm to count it for September. And it's not particularly good, but it's been sticking in my head ever since I watched it, so I have to recommend it. Um, it's Caligula, the 1980 movie. Um, oh, right. Oh, yeah, whatever. following, um, starring Martin McDowell and um, directed Clock by... Clockwork Orange. Yeah, yeah. Clockwork Orange, and then directed by um, famous Italian um, porn, movie, porn movie filmmaker, um, Tinto Brass. Is, it's he like a star- is he a porn director? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, this movie is technically an adult film too, but I'll go in more. It's very interesting. Uh, it's just, it's a fascinating movie. I have to really go, get it go into. Wait, literally, well, physically. real quick, uh, <laughs> real quick, real quick. How did you discover this movie? So I it. love um, ancient Rome, Roman history. Yeah, I've been literally stu- I've been literally listening to podcasts and studying it for eight years. About um, and um, I listened to this podcast called Life of Caesar um, with uh, Ray Harris Jr., who's a historian, and Cameron O'Reilly, who's not a historian but like he knows his stuff. And they're so funny. And so they started with Julius Caesar, like literally when I was a freshman in high school, I'm listening to them since. And now, now they're on um, Claudius, but right before that, they did Caligula. And they were saying this movie is actually really good and that you should watch it because um, it gets, has, doesn't really have very good reviews, but they said that it's actually pretty accurate. So you should watch it. So I was like, okay, I'll watch it. And um, it has a lot of problems, but I appreciate a lot of aspects of it. So first of all, um, a lot of like filmmakers tend to like to portray the Romans as being very, you know, prim and proper, you know, very like gentlemanly, like short cut hair, very professional looking, very clean. And that wasn't really the case. I won't go into any specifics as to what like horrible, like lewd acts ancient Romans did back in the day, but they were crazy sex scenes. And um, <laughs> this movie definitely captures that aspect more, a little bit too much actually, but I'm happy that movie decided to go into that direction saying like, hey, these, these Roman emperors, thought they were going to die at any second. They had extreme wealth, but also their lives were always on the line. So that kind of makes you crazy. And, you know, when you have all that power, you tend to abuse it. Like you will see with, um, you know, any of the real, any of the Roman emperors. And um, the movie does a good job because Martin McDowell plays Caligula. does a good job showing how Caligula's life could have, could have literally ended at any second because um, 
he was the adopted heir of Tiberius, who was the emperor before him. And Tiberius later in his life became crazy and he literally could have had him executed if he decided to because he was going getting paranoid. He was executing senators left and right. And, you know, Caligula just was like, any day now he could decide, he could decide that I'm not the heir anymore and kill me. Um, and it captures that really well. It kind of, you know, shows that Caligula kind of gets a bad rap of just being the crazy Roman emperor. But it shows that, you know, he, first of all, he was very diplomatic earlier in his career, but he was always constantly under threats of assassination that, you know, that's going to mess up your mind at some point. And um, he does a good job of showing that. But the set design in this movie is some of the best I've ever seen. I have to say that. Um, it, it makes Rome kind of look like a nightmare, which is very interesting. It's like, it's very extravagant. They, they, they have the royal palaces, but like there's always like these weird voids of smoke in the background. It just makes you feel like you're in some weird fever dream. And it really fits like the craziness that Caligula is probably feeling. And the, the, set, the costumes are great, set designs are great, and uh, Martin McDowell is great as Caligula. But movie being kind of an adult film, there are a lot of um, orgy scenes that just go on and on and on and on. Wow. And, and the movie's two and a half hours long, and most of it is wow. that kind of content. Oh, and it's disappointing because Caligula's life is so interesting. And there's parts where they do go into the political side of it, where Caligula is trying to be a decent person at first, but senators just want him gone because they want the Republic back. He can't really. Kind of goes crazy from paranoia, and that's the end of it. Um, there's so many interesting things they could talk about in the movie that they don't, and it's very disappointing because of that. But that being said, it it is willing to go into um, the darker side of like the Roman elite that I really appreciated that a lot of movies don't are afraid to go into. And um, I think if you want a good balance of two, I'd recommend HBO's Rome, which came out in the mid 2000s. And it covers, um, you know, Caesar's rise in Gaul all the way up to um, Oct- um, Augustus Caesar basically destroying all of his enemies and then, and then becoming the first emperor of Rome. And um, it definitely handles like the, the more violent and lewd sides of Rome while also, you know, not being as, you know, um, gratuitous as Caligula. But I have to say, Caligula, for its many flaws, it's stuck in my head. And I really appreciate you know, its willingness to do what many other movies would not do when covering, like, ancient, you know, medieval Rome. Not medieval Rome, ancient Rome. I, uh, yeah, that was, that was a very kind of jarring thing to, like, look at your letterbox and, like, what the fuck's Caligula? Yeah. And you're basically, it's like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, I'm actually gonna be the first one to recommend a book this time around. Oh my god, it's a monumental occasion. Um, so, I was very curious, uh, about the author Zadie Smith, so I picked up her book on beauty, and, Basically, everyone would probably know Zadie Smith from the novel White Teeth, which is basically the early college Bible for contemporary literature and contemporary kind of, um, you know, uh, race literature, rather. Uh, And I won't go too much into, like, race politics and what kind of is tackled in this book, but I do want to say, kind of talk about her writing style a little bit. Um, This is like, she has a very wonderful prose it's very able to capture the very human qualities of people. And because I feel like a lot of times you talk about kind of contemporary novels and they're shining away from the fact that characters can, people are just often annoying. Like, but they're also, they're annoying from our perspective because they're their own individuals with a sense of goals and purposes and ideologies. But we can view them as annoying. But when we get to their perspective, they, they, they're, they're, motivations are completely rational and i think this book does a wonderful job of conveying that kind of idea and it's basically centered around a very uh, academic family and this this couple howard and oh oh dear god um i I can't remember her name howard the husband and uh someone else the, the the wife which is i'm butchering it i'm sorry uh but basically it's a it's a multi race family and it talks a lot about that kind of dynamic and there's this also wonderful kind of political discussion this book has where it paints both the right and left and negative sides which we're not going to get into a massive political discussion but i found that really really refreshing where you're falling to perspectives from this very liberal um character and his rival in the book is a very conservative other uh, academic but they both they paint both of them in very very kind of like belittling sides where each side has its positives and its negatives and they try to tackle each perspective i really really dug this book i I, it's stuck with me more than i I thought it would i read it about a month ago uh, at the beginning of september and i have to admit i was very impressed and i'm really curious to check out zadie smith's other work if you're not a big fan of like book set and kind of like academic environments where the characters 
talk like academics and you're like, this just sounds like very like um, stuck up and pretentious. I think this book does a good job of bringing those people down to a very human level. There's another book out there uh, called uh, Secret History by Donna Tart, who wrote The Goldfinch. Ooh, I want to, I've been hearing a lot about that book. Uh, I hated it. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, it. I, it, because it's one of those books that is framed in an academic setting where the characters, all they do is talk in this academic and flowery language, but it's not like there's nothing to it, it feels like. It feel, it, that one feels very, does feel very pretentious. You might like it. I, I don't know. Um, but do you it, own it? I do own it, yes. It's somewhere Oh, in... I, I love to borrow it. Yeah. Um, I'm not reading it anytime soon, so you can freaking keep it for all you care. I'm never going to read that <laughs> book again. Uh, but yeah, Zadie Smith on Beauty. If you had read White Teeth uh, and haven't gotten a check, chance to check this one out, I would really recommend it. It's a good book. Yeah. Cool. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. Um, I'm going to recommend next, uh, I've talked about before, uh, Wong Kar Wai's Chungking Express. Um, yeah. So I don't want to give away too much about it. I'll say two things. One, this movie made Quentin Tarantino. I don't want to go outside. You can keep talking. <laughs> keep talking. Okay. <laughs> this is a movie that made Quentin Tarantino cry. What do you want? What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> That's Matt's 16-year-old dog right there. That's going on the podcast highlights. Yeah. What do you want? Uh, uh, so, so Chunking Express made Quentin Tarantino cry because, and quote unquote, he said, I've ne I never knew I could love a movie this much. Mm. Um, Quentin Tarantino can, also had Unstoppable, that train movie with Chris Pine and Denzel Washington as one of his best movies of the decade. So, if I'm not mistaken, he loves Chris Pine. He thinks Chris Pine's the best, like, actor. Why has Chris Pine not been in a Tarantino today? movie? I don't know. Okay. Um, Tyler, I think this movie is so far up your alley that when you watch it, you're going to be like, why haven't I seen this sooner? Because okay. the, re the reason is this movie feels like burning. Oh, fuck. <laughs> if, if this, I've never seen, like, it's almost like they're, it's like a, not exactly like, I don't want to say like the word sequel, but it's like, the, it's just the, the atmosphere of the film. I was like, this feels like burning. Okay. And, um. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to say whether I liked it or hated it. I'm sure you can guess how I feel, yep. but I'll leave it up for interpretation. Um, yeah. And it's on the Criterion channel. Wong Kar Wai, Wai is, this is the first one I've, I've seen from him. And he's very notorious director. Uh, one of his other films being In the Mood for Love, which is also on the Criterion channel. I have not seen that yet. I've heard so much about it. Um, and uh, after watching Sean King Express, I... I'm very excited to see his other works. So, Chunking Express, 1995. You can stream it on Criterion Channel. Highly, highly, highly recommend. I'll probably honestly check it out this week because I'm very curious yeah. about it. And I want to. And I know it's not super long. It's, what, an hour 40? So Hour 42. Yeah, I want to give that one a shot. Mm -hmm. Matt, what's your name? Matt, we, uh, we heard you go, what do you want? Yeah. What do you want? Well, that was, that was a joking tone. Yeah, he, was, he doesn't understand the... Um, he, he doesn't think he doesn't think that that film project takes priority over his need just to go outside. <laughs> just fine. He's old at this point. Um, so next movie I saw was from Taiwan. I talked about this on another podcast, but I will go a little more detail. It's called The Assassin. It came out in 2015. Um, it won Best Director at Cannes, like in 2016 or something. And um, this movie might have the best cinematography I've ever seen in any movie ever. Um, the shots, both inside. Um, and like these like really luxurious medieval um, Chinese um, palaces are incredibly beautiful. Um, and the outside like landscapes in Taiwan are also incredibly well shot. Like you can see like every like individual like blade of grass sticking out. It's like all like the sun's like baking on it and it's so beautiful. Um, the plot is okay. Um, it's done very much through visual storytelling. Um, it's basically about um, following this girl who um, is an assassin. She's like an trained assassin. And um, her mother was the empress of whatever region they're in. And um, she was supposed to be the heir, but she was then displaced from my mother for her younger brother. And now the younger brother thinks that she wants to kill him now that he's emperor. And um, the plot is OK. Um, it, and the characterization is also kind of OK. I kind of want to rewatch it. It's very fascinating. It's been sticking with my head for a while. And I would say the movie just like just to give your eyes like the most pleasurable experience of their lives. I just say just watch this movie because man, 
it's still beautifully shot, and it has a lot of inspiration from one of my favorite movies, Crouch of Tiger, Hidden Dragon, in regards to like, its, its use of martial arts in movies. So, I mean, if you like those kind of movies too, I'd recommend it a lot. There's not really much to say about it because the plot is fairly bare bones, but I think if I rewatch it, I'll probably like it a lot more. How, uh, how did you even, find out about Even when I watched it, I did like it a lot the first time. How did you find out about this movie? Um, I don't know. I just, I guess, come across trailers randomly. <laughs> <laughs> and like, same with like, 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 with, like the lobster and like Calvary and stuff. Movies that I love, I just come across random trailers. Like, oh, this looks cool. And then it comes out a couple months later. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. And then I, it was on Netflix and I was so excited. But then I just didn't watch it because I put it on my list. And anything goes on my list on Netflix is just going to stay there forever and um, never be watched. And then I was like disappointed. And then I saw it was on Amazon. I was like, click immediately. It's like, I'm yeah. going to watch this right now. <laughs> and um, I really enjoyed it. Um, just, just, just saw the trailer. It's like, oh, this looks interesting. And um, I'm definitely glad I, I uh, stuck through it and watched yeah. it. Um, I'm also going to talk about a movie that needs no extra words from me, but just so you can get a taste of what kind of movies I like. This is a movie, it's a social network. Uh, it's one of the best movies of the decade. It's, it's honestly, very few like times do, you, uh, do I watch a movie and then three weeks later, I'm like, I kind of want to rewatch that movie like right now. And like, it sticks with you. This is David Fincher's best. I'm going to go out and objectively say it's his best movie right there. Uh, if you want objectively objectively right there if you want I, you. I know if you want the joke behind that go watch our live video essays or objectively bad video uh, with the ryan johnson face on the cover of the thumbnail but this is one of those movies that's just one of the best edited movies i've ever seen it's so succinctly edited that every line of dialogue every for every shot every frame of the movie feels like it has been deliberately placed every action the characters make it just feels so perfect and there is something so engaging about this movie, even framing it from a context of the fact that we kind of know who Mark Zuckerberg is now, but this like very cool, I mean, like, very quaint and simple movie just feels like this very like dangerous precursor to the world we're in now, knowing that most of it isn't real and what happened, but the way in which it's structured and, and just everything about it, the performances, just the, the fact that, I was legitimately on the edge of my seat when – spoilers for The Social Network. If you haven't seen it, what are you doing? It's on Netflix. Um, but when he's re he's revealing how Eduardo's shares were diluted and the fact he's like, what were, uh, what were Sean's uh, shares diluted? Sean Parker's shares diluted to? They weren't. And what were yours diluted to? Like 0.03% is like the most gripping moment of a movie I've ever seen, even though I've seen the movie before, even though it's no like – real consequences to anything it's just this so much personal movie the soundtrack spectacular the mood is spectacular rooney mara is in the movie for like seven minutes and she's probably one of the best parts of the movie it's just it's one of those movies that you watch and you go this is why movies are a thing like it just it like it, re it reinvigorates it for you a little bit yeah i cannot recommend this movie enough if you have it, it's two hours on the nose it's so digestible I love this movie. Go watch The Social Network if you haven't already. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Fully, I completely, completely agree with what Tyler just said. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna rec the next three movies I'm going to recommend I haven't watched this month because I've been really busy uh, with school work. But uh, um, I love these films, and uh, I want more, more people to see them. So the first one is uh, Solaris. This is Andre Tarkovsky's 1972 film. A little background about this is... Uh, Tarkovsky was a Russian filmmaker, um, and he saw 2001 A Space Odyssey, and he absolutely abhorred it. Um, he thought that Kubrick's idea of what the future of space would look like was too clean and polished and um, completely unrealistic. And so he went out and he created this, this movie, Solaris, and it's adapted from a Russian novel of the same name. And... It's about a space a station. By. I don't remember the, the name. Oh, not like a famous Russian author. It's I believe it's a Russian oh, author. Oh wait, I, I know who wrote it. Um, because he wrote another movie called The Hard to Be God, which like I really want to watch yeah. too. Well, he wrote the yeah. movie that the movie, the movie Hard to Be God is based on. I yeah. think he's like a famous science fiction writer, but I can't remember what his name is. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was random. <laughs> yeah, that was random. Um. I believe there's a 2003 movie with George Clooney uh, where they adapt. Yeah. It's the American version. Yeah. Uh, here, I don't really hear that many great things about it. But um, not. 
So a little background about Solaris. It's a science fiction film because it's set in space. It's about a space station that's orbiting, orbiting a planet called Solaris. And on the space station, there's a few scientists. And this planet, Solaris, uh, makes, things, makes weird things happen on this space station. And it's, if you're looking for a very science fiction-ish film, which it is, you might be disappointed because it's more philosophical, if anything. The science fiction is the background. Mm -hmm. Tarkovsky, it, like, as I've, I've said this a, plenty of times, he's my favorite filmmaker, and it's not even close. No one else comes close. Um, can you say you can mathematically prove that he's the best director? Yes, I can. Okay. Not mathematically, but I, but, uh, I have a line of reasoning that okay. furthers what, my statement. What is it real quick, just in case okay. people are curious? So many people say that Stanley Kubrick is the greatest filmmaker of all time. Okay. In 1960, Stanley Kubrick wrote a letter to Ingmar Bergman and, and basically poured out his heart and said, your films have impacted me like no one else. Um, I adore your films. You are the best filmmaker working today, in my opinion. So that's, that's, Tarkov, or that's Kubrick on Ingmar Bergman. And then Ingmar Bergman, he says that Tarkovsky is the most important filmmaker working today and um, Bergman was like the biggest fan of his films. And Bergman is considered to be, like by many, to be the master. But okay. Bergman what if Tarkovsky thought- was inspired by another filmmaker before him? Yeah. What? What if, what if Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky was inspired by another filmmaker before him so that he's um, the greatest filmmaker ever made? Well- And what if that- it, and what if that I will that I will, another movie before that I will was- I will remain ignorant to that fact, this line of- What if the director is like, these books inspired my movies more than anything else? Does that author become the most important they, okay. person ever made? Tyler, you've seen Stalker, right? A long time ago. Yeah, it's a long time ago okay. I watched Stalker. Um, there are no films like, like Tarkovsky's. I have yet to see any films like his. Um, he's, ba he, uh, he's like a, he was a philosopher. And he used film as this medium to just sort of push this very, he's like very Charlie spiritual. Kaufman. Yeah, uh, it's a different better. version. <laughs> it, I, I love, I, yeah, it's, his films are so spiritual. It's like when I watch a Tarkovsky film, I'm so relaxed and I just feel like I can, I just learn from him, just like his view on the world. And it's just so powerful. So I'm going off, I'm going on and on here, but Solaris by Tarkovsky, um, 1972, highly recommend. It's you only made, made 11 movies? Yes, and they're all masterpieces. I've seen them. Damn, um, all of them. Only even, eleven. That's a lot. Even there will be no. No, no, no. Well, today. Well, 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 no. Okay, so he did. Technically, he did less than eleven. He did. Uh, he did Ivan's Childhood, nineteen sixty-two. He did Andre Rublev, nineteen sixty-six, which is probably one of the greatest epics ever released. His his he first did, like major, like major film release is nineteen eighty-three. Nostalgia, nostalgia. No, that's that's not right. Well, his that's other his, work, first... his other ones are forty six minutes, nineteen minutes, sixty two minutes. I guess sixty two minutes technically qualifies as a feature release. So I guess if we're doing that, then it's Voyage in Time. It's Ivan Childhood, nineteen sixty two. Andre Rublev, nineteen sixty six. Solaris, nineteen seventy two. Stock, uh, no, The Mirror, nineteen seventy five. Oh, I messed and up. The Mirror. The, to, to me, The Mirror is probably the, the most beautiful film of all time in terms of it, one of the best shot films ever. And it's funny because the, this, it's either that or Barry Lyndon, and they came out Andre the same year. Rublev is 205 minutes, Matt. Yes. It is, yeah, it's a long one. Um, <laughs> it's it's probably, you. that's probably one of the best movies of all time. Not even joking. Uh I'm, I'm going on and on here, but, and I'm actually going to, the next movie I'm going to recommend is a Tarkovsky film. Should I just get it out of the way now? And then I can let you guys go. Cause my next film was going to be. No, Stalker. we have to, no, we have we have to, to go in the We circle. have to go in the same order. Yeah. You can't do that to us. Bad. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on the topic of Tarkovsky. No, you get to come back to it. The order. So you yeah, wait. you can't. All right. Do all right. Matt, all right. So, um, I'm recommending. So another movie that I saw, I decided randomly. So I was watching community the TV show, and there's like a scene where there's like this fairly famous paintball episode, and there's a scene where um, Chang, who's like the guy from The Hangover, the 
the guy that kidnapped from the hangover of the Chinese guy. Um, oh yeah. And Literally. he's in, the, but he's, he's hilarious in the community. And there's a scene where he like walks in and there's like playing like, like cool Chinese music in the background. He starts shooting the paintball, like gun like this. Yeah. It's slow motion. I thought the scene was so cool. And it's, and then, so I was reading comments for like a YouTube clip that showed that and like, oh, this is basically a John Woo film. So like, oh, I don't want to watch, John, I want to watch John Woo movies now. So I started with um, A Better Tomorrow, which is in Hong Kong, but I'm talking about the next movie, which he did, which came out six years later, called Hard Boiled, starring um, Chow Young Fat, who plays like the, who um, is the main character of this movie, but he's, you probably know him from Crouching Tiger, from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon as like the bald, like protagonist guy. Um, this movie is really amazing. It's, um, Chow Young Fat is like this um, detective um, cop guy who, um, likes jazz and his and his his partner is killed um during like a raid where they're um they they find these these triad guys in Hong Kong who are like who are hiding um who are smuggling guns and then like there's this huge active scene and his partner dies so he's kind of on edge. He's determined to take down this this triad and um on the other side there is a, a secret agent inside the triad who um is what well, was undercover and it's you're following his story too. And um this movie has some of the best action scenes I've ever seen in a movie. I think I said this in the last review, but this reminds me a lot of uh, The Raid, where it just feels like a bunch of people who are super passionate. I gotta about, watch it now. Um, what? I gotta watch it now. It's not, it's free on YouTube. What? Yeah, I literally just Google Google Hard Boiled right now, and the movie's just there. Um, <laughs> well, and, then. Like there, there are so many great tracking shots. There, like the whole like last act is just one long action scene, and. Um, you just you just feel the, the passion of filmmaking oh God, throughout this really? movie because John Woo clearly cares a lot. The, the, the sets are really great. It absolutely is. Holy yeah. moly. Yeah, so just plug it, just like get your um, cord and put it, put it plug it into your TV and watch it. Um, and like I said, like, so there's a lot of passion behind the filmmaking. There's a lot of really amazing action scenes that happen. Like there's like really cool like uh, blood squirt effects and um, the, the plot kind of reminds me of The Departed a little, a little bit. It's not as convoluted as the as the Departed, but the um, it does have that kind of same vibe. And like, there's like this this love for Hong Kong in it. Like Hong Kong feels like a character in the in the movie. There's some good jazz music, and Chow Yun Fat is one of the most charismatic actors I've ever seen uh, in an action movie. He's like I was I knew him from Catch a Dagger, Hidden Dragon, obviously, but he his breakout was in like a is it was in a supporting role in um um that other movie I just mentioned, um, something to a better tomorrow, but then he plays the lead in this movie and he kills it. He's so good. And I want to watch more John Woo movies because um, we, we just watched um, Extraction, the Tom, um, what, what was his name? The Thor guy. Uh, Chris Emsworth. Chris Emsworth guy. And it has, it has terrible tracking shots in that movie. And this movie has real tracking shots with real like stunts and everything in it and real, real effects. And it just puts movies like Extraction to shame. And um, Tyler, I think, would probably like this the most. Like, this is a movie where Tyler would probably be laughing nonstop throughout the whole movie. I gotta watch it. Because people get shot in the face and it's awesome. And it's, and it's, the plot is dumb. It's turned your brain off kind of plot, but it's really helps you, you know, see that you really feel the passion and the love for what, the, for what John Woo and the people behind the camera are doing. And you really appreciate that. So I'd highly recommend this movie. I will probably end up checking it out soon because you've, yeah. The, the fact that you're so high in like an action movie like this is just right up my alley. Yeah, I think I th- Tyler especially, I think you would probably love this movie. Um, all right, the next movie I'm gonna recommend is basically, unfortunately, it's gonna sound like I'm piggybacking off like Reddit love circle jerk, but uh, I actually watched the movie 2017 when I saw a brief trailer for it and was like, what is this? Uh, it's Columbus by Kogan Nada, I believe is how you pronounce it. Who is this? Is his first directed movie? Uh, that's not true. No, yes, it is. Um, it's his first feature length. He's had some experience with directing and kind of directing other stuff. I, uh, I adore this movie. I, I loved it back in 2017, and I, I found when I signed up for the Criterion channel that it was on there, and this was, like, the immediate, like, I got to watch this. Like, what am I doing? Like, stop everything. It is a movie that uh, frames a lot of its issues. Not a lot of its issues, but a lot of the themes it tackles through architecture. And it's architecture that is ultimately framing life, and it's these little it's ultimately a movie about the little moments. It's a movie that focuses on the little details that are often missed. And it has two incredible performances by John Cho and Haley Lou Richardson, who are this people who are in this town. John Cho comes to care for his ailing father. And Haley, Haley Lou Richardson is a, is a young college student who has been stuck in this town her whole life. And it's ultimately 
the relationship between them and how they move forward and how they grow as people. Ferris is one of those movies that I kind of love where you'll see the more we talk about movies, I love when you just kind of put a camera down and you let like the shot happen and it's not constant moving. And then it's a lot of like framing the shots like they are architecture. And then finally, when you get an interaction between the people, the camera moves and it feels alive and it feels human. And it's these little tiny touches that just make the movie so magnetic to watch. I love everything about this movie. It's just so absurdly human and authentic and just kind of it just feels like people and it's these real issues and it's just so lovely you guys mark you would absolutely adore this movie i'm just telling you that right now matt i'll I'll have to check it out it's like right up your alley if you if from what you've told me about tarkovsky you would fucking love this matt you would definitely like it too i think it i think it's like right up mark's alley though Mm -hmm. we're just kind of like this is what it is uh it's on criterion channel reddit loves it now uh, so mm-hmm. I'm no longer special, but <laughs> watch Columbus. I know, I know Koganada is making another movie, which means I'm like seeing that day one. I'm, I want to find out what it is. It's called uh, after Yang and it stars like Colin Farrell, isn't it? And uh, wow. yeah, so Colin Farrell's in it. So I cannot wait for that movie. So Columbus, that's my recommendation. Mark. I definitely, to Tur- I, I got to check that out. Yeah, check it out. Um, Tarkovsky round two. Tarkovsky round two, uh, Stalker. Ding, ding. Um, t- Tyler's seen this movie. He watched it for his film class. Yeah, I watched it when I was like eighteen for film class. Yeah. Um, this just let it ran on Tinder the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a stupid joke. <laughs> it's just a dumb joke that no one gets outside of us. Uh, so Stalker was my entry point to Tarkovsky. I think it's a great entry point. Um. It's I, a I science pre- fiction film. I, I want to preface one thing. In that film class, there I, I fell asleep for every movie except for three. That was the Joan of Arc 1920s movie. There that was, movie's so good. That movie's great. There was a Gus Van Sant movie that was framed from the Columbine shooting, and it was Stalker. Everything else I passed out in. Everything else you, didn't, you, you didn't fall asleep in Stalker? No. I, that was because I found it engaging. Um, wow. But everything wow. else is – yeah, everything else I was like, this is cool. Like, Joan of Arc, that movie, I was like, this is amazing. So, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm surprised you didn't fall asleep in Stalker because honestly, like Tarkovsky kind of uses boredom as a as a device because uh, it's kind of it's kind of hard to describe it. I actually I I saw an interview with Ryan Johnson uh, on some of the Criterion Channel where he talks about Stalker, and he sort of pointed this out where it's like um, Tarkovsky just like he'll 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 shoot. It's like a five minute shot. It's really long. I think Matt, you would you would absolutely fucking hate this. Honestly, I, you're gonna be like you're gonna be like, why is this here? Um, but the shots are so long. It's kind of like what you what you just said, Tyler. Just put the camera down and let things happen. Um, and Tarkovsky does that, and it's it's you're just like, huh? It's this kind of movie. And if you just sort of just like let yourself just be taken over by it, you just give yourself in, dude. Just be, you'd be so surprised. This and. Um, I should say that this this uh, this movie is adapted from the Russian novel Roadside Picnic. Now, Roadside Picnic, uh, the, Roadside the, in, Picnic. In Roadside Picnic, the story is there's this area that uh, like a, like an alien ship or like a or like a meteor has crashed, and all the surrounding area is uh, around the meteor uh, for like miles and miles uh, has you know, everything's changed. Like, things are weird. There's things roaming about. It's kind of like annihilation tr- for a more it's, contemporary. It's like, it's basically annihilation. Um, and so there's there's people who can go into this, the, it's called the zone. And the people who can navigate it successfully are called stalkers. Now, at, at the center of the zone, there's a room. And in this room, allegedly, your greatest uh, desire is is fulfilled and so what the the stalkers do is they take people out like from outside the zone who want their greatest desire filled and they like they basically sherpa them to to the room and so it's it's this very interesting story of these stalkers they're like don't go that way or don't look this direction because you know the zone will kill you like the zone is this omnipotent force that's just uh that's constantly watching you, and if you trip up, it's going to kill you. It's 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 a it's a movie that the the 
the villain. I, I don't even want to say there's a villain, but like the zone is this this like sort of like implied malevolent force. Mm. And it's so really, it's yeah, it's, like it's always at the it's always at the peripherals. And this is actually inspired a video game, the Stalker series. Metro. Oh yeah, that, no Stalker as well. well Stalker. Stalker. Metro is the sequel, like the sequels to Stalker, but yeah. Yeah. So. Um, it's a science fiction Metro. film. It's a science fiction film, but don't act, don't go in expecting like a, you know your standard uh, science fiction where it's like guns and aliens and blah, and this and that. It's very slow. It's deliberately slow. And this movie is like it's like it finishes and you feel like you've been meditating for two hours and forty minutes. It's <sighs> it's incredible. It's one of the most unique movie experiences I've had in my life. It is worth the ride. Uh, I don't know if I'd recommend it to you, Matt, given that I know what your movie tastes are. But for anyone who's interested in Tarkovsky... Matt took that as a spot. You can see that in his face. He was just like... Every, every that's not, that's not a go, dig. That's not a go, dig. Go, oh, Matt's going to hate this movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a dig. I just know what your tastes are. I know what your tastes are. I recommend um, the girl John got seen. The movie's two and a half hours long. It's not about the length. It's about the... It's You're the guy who's like, why is this here? I recommend reading Calvary. Calvary's not exactly a... a do not even, don't movie. even try. Don't even try comparing Calvary to this. <laughs> well, Calvary is better, probably. <laughs> no, Calvary is amazing, but it's not. It's no no stalker. Um, so I, I I will stop now. I've been talking about Tarkovsky for too long. Gonna, I'm gonna get who's... I'm gonna get a string of reviews on Letterbox. It's Matt watching two hours and forty minute movies, and they're all five stars. It's like fuck you. I told you I'd like them. It's not about the length. It's about the way the film is shot and what is shown and how Tarkovsky. Uh, uh, gives shot, t- uh, you know, camera time to his subjects. The so, only movie uh, I know for certain Matt would not like, and that's because of his disdain for Blue Velvet as a racer head. Like, that's like, if you hate David Lynch that much because of Blue Velvet, you just, I don't hate David Lynch. I just think he's overrated. Then you would think racer off like, one film or two films. I've seen, actually. I've seen, I've seen um, Blue Velvet, I've seen Dune, and I've seen like most of Twin Peaks. That's like oh, that's 20, right. That's like oh, that's fifteen right. hours that's of right. yeah. David Lynch. I'm just, I'm just saying that's like the one I, I would know, knowing you, that you would probably not be a fan of. So to wrap this up real quick, uh, Stalker, 1979. If you're, if you've been, I've been talking about Tarkovsky a lot. I'm probably talking about him too long. But if Who you are interested, if I've, if I've piqued your interest, I would recommend starting with Stalker and seeing. Uh, I think it's the best entry point, and I think from Stalker you'll know. Um, this is something I'm into or this is something I'm not into because Stalker is a good gauge for the rest of the Tarkovsky filmography. So it's on the Criterion channel. You can stream it if you have a subscription. And uh, if you end up watching it, let us know. I'm, I, I'm very curious to see what, if any viewers watch it, what they think. Because I love talking about the uh, Tarkovsky films. So I'll pass it off to you, Matt, now. I have a book <gasps> that I read. It's a, it's a nonfiction book called Slurs of the Sahara. It's written by this lady, wow. San Moa, from Taiwan, and it's about um, a where, Chinese oh. woman. What? I was going to say, where did you, where'd you hear that? So like, I, I, I did an internship for a travel writing uh, company, and they, they, they wanted me to review the book, so I read a couple of chapters. I wrote a review for it. If you Google San Moa, the girl's name, my article is the person that comes up on Google. Um, hey. How do you spell her name? How do, I'm gonna look it S-A-N-M-A-O. Up. It should be, at least. Okay. We're gonna look it up. Keep talking about it while we, while um, we fact check you. So she grew up in China, obviously, and then um, she decided to travel the world at a young age, and eventually she ends up in um, the Spanish Sahara, and lives with um, her husband Jose, who's from Spain, and um, she lives among a community of the Sahrawi people, which is kind of in this weird area between um, Spain and Morocco, and it's about her trying to survive out in the desert, living in this desert community. And you know, kind of coming, kind of like being opposed to some of their like the more sexist culture aspects. Like there's this, mm-hmm. there's this one um, excerpt where she's attending a wedding, and like there's some very horrific things that happen in it, and she gets mm-hmm. very upset by it. But um, it's cool because she is very inspirational for me because she loves to travel. She loves. She was like fluent in like five different languages. She studied in the U.S. She studied in Germany. She's fluent in Spanish. Ar- your like, uh, your thing is most definitely not the first thing that comes up. It was when I googled it. The first um, thing that comes up is a New York Times article. Oh, Same. Okay. I looked it up as well. <laughs> okay, maybe because I just googled a lot on my phone. When I googled my phone, <laughs> yeah. that was the first thing that came up. Um, and she's written a couple of um, you know, ex- uh, a couple of like travel stories from like all all over the world where she went. But 
it definitely like, picks up later on because the Sahari people eventually like want independence from yep. Spain. And she's kind of caught in like the civil war and about dealing with like surviving through that and also including like dealing with the hardships of just living out in the desert in general. And um, she really does a good job of capturing the beauty of the desert while also like, you know, establishing the fact that, you know, this culture is very cruel um, at times because they have to be because this is obviously not the ideal place to live and like understanding these people. And I just found it to be very interesting. So I really like small groups of like, like history and like different cultures and stuff that don't really get, you know, talked about very often. I think this book is very good and, and she's very famous in China. And um, this is the first of her, of her stories that was ever translated into English. So that's, that's why I like this, this book, Stories of the Hair is a big deal. So I think if you like travel stories, if you like, you know, like, like real life fish out of the water stories, I think that this would be really good for anyone who's interested in that kind of stuff. And if you're interested in the desert, if you're interested in the Sahara, de Sahara Desert as well. Nice. Um, yeah, yours, I had to look up uh, San Mo Go Nomad, and then yours came up. I'm, so. wait, I'm Googling that because I'm, I'm convinced. Uh, uh, it is not. While you're Googling that, I want to recommend uh, a 1957 movie. It is the first thing that comes up. S-A-N-M-A-O. M-O-A. S-A-N-M-O-A. Well, well, okay, ready? I'm going to look it up real quick, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to talk. O-A? Yeah. Oh, I oh, I did A-O. S-A-N-M-O-A. -A. I think I said it wrong the first time. Yeah, it was for Go, Go Nomad. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah. Well, That's if you right. type in, if you if you spell it uh, M-A-O, uh, the New York Times article comes up. So you actually spelled her name wrong. Oh, nice. <laughs> and no one noticed. And no one, it's S-A-N-M-A-O. <laughs> oh my that's amazing oh my god wow wow <laughs> what Andrew no should have caught that <laughs> i didn't know i noticed that um okay well uh yeah so speaking of spelling things wrong uh i'm going to talk about the 1957 movie paths of glory by stanley kubrick that has nothing wrong about it it's kind of wonderful I saw it earlier this September. It's very, very short. It's 88 minutes, but it's a very like harrowing account of uh, World War II. Yes, World War II. World War One. World War One. Uh, yeah, because trench warfare. Um, it has some of like the most like engaging war sequences uh, I've seen in a while. And putting it in a context like 1957, I mean, it's, it's a there's a tracking trench shot. I mean, it's just utterly incredible. Uh, I also find the uh, the politics behind it all to be almost as engaging as the conflict itself. And there's this, yep. wonder, there's this wonderful uh, like commentary on masculinity and masculinity during war. It's really, really phenomenal. If I were to slightly, I've talked about this before with you guys, but if I were to have any minor critique about it is it feels like sequences end very abruptly. And it's like yep. every single scene ends like half a second short where it doesn't like let anything sit before it's immediately onto the next one. And I'm not asking for like the characters to stare at the screen and like think, but it's like word cut boom and it's like I, well, it's like oh hold on and then they're immediately talking again. Feels like there needs to be a little bit of gap in between those sequences. Uh, and mm -hmm. again, the movie's 88 minutes, so I mean that would have been what like 30 extra seconds. So, yeah. very minor minor complaint, but it feels like the movie it's just like the, the pace of it feels very quick. Uh, but I I mean Stanley Kubrick yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that guy has to. That's an answer in and of itself. So, um, Mark? I fully agree with you, Tyler. Well, except for the, the abrupt part, that, that part didn't bother me. Um, Paths of Glory is is absolutely amazing. I highly recommend it as well. Um, my next recommendation is one of my favorite movies ever. <laughs> is this the final one? Is this number five for us? I think it is. Blue, Blue Velvet. Bell, oh my <laughs> gosh. Um, so. I'm, I'm a massive fan of Blue Velvet, Matt, not so much. Um, and I mean, it it came out in 1986. It's David Lynch. It's his fourth film. His first, it was he did Eraserhead, The Elephant Man, Dune, and then he did Blue Velvet. Uh, he wrote. He was having such a bad time with Dune. He absolutely just hated shooting the film. And, and he you just said needed it was a cult classic. And he he needed to pour his heart into something. And uh, because David Lynch is like a, a, the perfect example of an uncompromising artist. And um, there was so much studio interference with Dune that he just like, I need to do something. And so he wrote Blue Velvet and it was, he, he got the idea for the movie based on a song by Bobby, uh, 
can't remember his name, Bobby something. Um, and he heard the song and he's like, this feels like a movie. And he like, he's a guy who like meditates a lot. So he just, he just like came up with the story and he wrote the script real quick and he gave it to Kyle McLaughlin on the set of Dune. He's like, do you want to do this? Like this would be my next project. And so he did it. And this, you think this Kyle is McLaughlin, what, whatever his name is, took off that stupid fucking wig and Dune. He's like, oh, thank God. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd also say that probably my, maybe one of my least favorite parts of, of Blue Velvet is actually Kyle McLaughlin, but I couldn't see anybody else playing the role. I don't really take uh, that as yeah. you will. I don't think, I mean, I've seen, from what I've seen, I've seen Dune, Twin Peaks, and uh, Blue Velvet. I don't particularly think he's that great of an actor, but mm. um, yes. David yeah. Lynch sees something in him, I guess. Yeah, I think I think he just was like, oh, I found an actor who's weird enough to do my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he's so uh, handsome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Look at that hair. No, he's, he's not, not, he's not like, he's like, he's like, he's so handsome. Yeah. Because <laughs> David Lynch is that nasal, <laughs> nasal guy. He's is not he garbage. Really? <laughs> I've never listened to him speak. Is he super nasally? And... Oh, super nasally. Yeah, he's very nasally. Oh, my God. Okay. My name, just... my name is David Lynch. Um, you would think he'd be some, so, like, British or foreign And the director. older he gets, like, the more nasally becomes. I'm going to look up his weather report real quick and just listen to him while you guys are talking. So, uh, just quickly on Blue Velvet. I, I liked... You know, um, I already I mentioned this. Uh, we did the review for North by Northwest, and I talked about this thing called movie magic, and it's obviously a common term. But um, I just when a, when a movie has a scene that's just so good, or I'm caught off guard, where my jaw drops. Um, <laughs> and it's a Saturday. That was a pretty good impression, guys. Yeah. Why does he? Real quick, I'm sorry. Why does he do a weather report? He's very weird. Don't even ask. Okay. He's, he's over like 80. To, he's just like he's crazy doing, now. He's 74 actually, but he looks 90. Uh, yeah, he looks Today's so old. Number, <laughs> he's only 74. Yeah, he's Today's 74. His number is what? He just, okay, he's weird. He's weird, okay? He's a really weird guy. Okay. Um, so there is a scene in Blue Velvet where my jaw hit the floor so hard, and I could not believe what I was watching. It was absolutely magical. And, um, and it's just, it's surrealist. How Blue long has he been surrealist. doing this weather report for? I'm scrolling. He's been doing it since fucking mid 2000s. Um, you done? Yeah, I'm done. I'm just, I'm <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. Um, I, I, it's, it's hard to put into words. Blue Velvet, it, in my opinion, is, it is a masterpiece. Um, and I can, if someone, I mean, like Matt says, like, I hate this movie, or he didn't like I don't it. Hate it. I hate it. He doesn't hate it. He didn't, he didn't he care for words it. My mouth. <laughs> he didn't care for it. Matt, Matt did not care for it, right? Is that a good way of putting it? I did not care for it. I, I, found, I found it to be sporadically interesting. Yes. So that is probably the best way to put David Lynch. It's, you can't, you can't be... Murphy! Murphy! Yes, oh my god. Uh, it's very hard to be lukewarm on David Lynch. It's, it's, he's very polarizing. Um, if For those who are familiar with David Foster Wallace, he wrote Infinite Jest, The Pale King, Consider the Lobster. Um, he's, he did this great interview on Charlie Rose in the mid-90s about um, sort of postmodern art. And um, We're just watching I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching Murphy. Yeah, we're watching Matt's dog bed. try to dig it. Clearly a process. You, you can, you can, you can do it. I believe in you. He's got to, he's got to dig for, uh, <laughs> dig for the right spot. Considering this is going to be a YouTube <laughs> video, it's perfectly entertainment quality. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> Stop it. Lay down. So there's a there's a scene in Blue Velvet where there's, there's a guy is dead, but he's still standing, and there's no explanation as to why he's still standing, but he just is, and it feels right. It's that just cool. somehow it works. Yeah, it's really cool. He's just he's just standing there, but he's dead. It makes it just makes no sense, but it works. And David Foster Wallace was talking about the scene, and he was like, "Like this is what the postmodern era of art should be like. It's just it's just the, it's completely David Lynch. It is wholly the artist. Yep. He's completely uncompromising, and he spits at you know formulaic formulaic plots and ideas and blue." Uh, David Lynch and Blue Velvet is one of a kind. I highly recommend it. I've been talking way too long about it, but um, forewarning, there it, it's there's a lot of graphic nudity in it, and there's violence, and um, it's definitely a film you don't want to watch with you, you know your parents or any kids or anything. Just watch it. Just just it's it's out there. It's really out there. 
Just so in that in the in Noah Baumbach's Squid and the Whale, there's a very there's a scene in the movie dedicated <laughs> towards shitting on Blue Velvet, where the very douchebag pretentious father is like, I want to see Blue Velvet, and then yeah. he goes, and he's like, this is art, and then it's, you're just like, you're so annoying. So you know the- yeah, I mean, I with Blue Velvet, I I I play anti David Lynch to be to be funny. Um, yeah. But there are parts that I appreciate um, yeah. of the movie, particularly in the beginning and towards the end. Um, I think that some of his style, in my opinion, is a little like over exaggerated. Like I think that he has a problem writing like good character dialogue scenes, which I've, I mean, I've, which I've seen in Twin Peaks and in Blue Velvet. In my opinion, I mean, I mean, they're like, there's, it's cool. The body stands up and it does things, but there's also like a scene where they talk about what beer they like, and it's just kind of like, okay, why is this here? Um, oh my god maybe there's a reason for it i don't know but it didn't do anything for me i can see why you think that way i think the the discussions about beer and blue velvet you got to know the fact that you think it's it's product placement and david lynch with every fiber of his being hates product placement i can assure you it's not he intentionally put it in there and i I didn't um, think it's product placement i just thought that he was i just assumed it was his characterization but um, yeah yeah, I mean, there are, like, I was really into the ending of Blue Velvet. Um, yeah. I do want to see Mulholland Drive really badly. Um, yes, but... Mulholland Drive is an entirely separate beast. I think yeah. everybody at, in this podcast would absolutely, I've seen it, yeah. so I know you guys are going to love it. I just uh, feel or, a separation. I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. From his characters, um, yeah. I just feel like there's always, a, like, for me, there's always a separation between me and, like, relating to his characters, and that's just my problem, but, um, so I guess this is my turn. Are you all set? Well, I just want to say one more thing about Mulholland Drive. Uh, and I, I haven't seen The Handmaiden. Sorry, everyone. We had uh, Tyler messed up, and he um, ended the last conversation, so we had to wait a long time, and I'm starving. And <laughs> we get through. So, Mark, you had something you want to say about Mulholland Drive. Yeah, we were on the topic of David Lynch and Mulholland Drive. Um, so I know that you guys, from what I gauge about what you guys said about The Handmaiden and just this beautiful story, uh, that is what... I assume I, Mulholland Drive is just like that. It's this beautiful story of two women. Who okay, love back to my point. <laughs> you Mulholland. got everything off? Yeah. That oh, was it. Okay. Oh. Cool. All right. Oh, wow. So I'm going to talk really, I, no one really cares, but I'm going to talk about next one. I'm talk about it anyways. So that'll be really quick. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> Stone Cold Steve Austin's Broken Skull Session with Kurt Angle. Oh my <laughs> God. Damn it. This is an hour and 46 minutes long, so it's technically the length of feature length film. Uh, I just want to clarify that. So it's basically on the W Network, they had podcasts, and we, there's a Stone, Stone Cold podcast with, with old re- wrestling veterans, but this is like a video, so you actually see them talking. And Kurt Angle is interesting because he's an Olympic gold medalist winner, 1996. He won um, a gold medal in Greco-Roman wrestling with a broken neck, um, which is incredibly impressive. That's amazing. Um, and later on, because of his fame, he went into wrestling, and he originally pro wrestling, with the fake wrestling, and he originally tried to write What? CW, yeah, sorry. Uh, Santa Claus isn't real either. Um, <laughs> we might have tried team. out for ECW, um, which is extreme championship wrestling, and yeah. he's very religious. And he was gonna go for it because his friend Shane Douglas was working there. And the last like part of episode that he that he was there, they had a, they had a fake crucifixion. <laughs> oh no! And he was like really against that. Like basically a raven who was like a cult guy, um, crucified Sandman, and he was just like abhorred by it. And everything. So then he eventually went to WWF, which is now WWE. And um, he thought when he was when he was going to debut that everyone was going to cheer for him because he's an Olympic gold hero. But Vince McMahon knew that they were going to boo the crap out of him because he was like just too good at everything. Like yeah. he's too accomplished. So people like regular people wouldn't like him. So they said whenever you go out there, just make sure when you win that you act like you just won the Olympic gold medal every time you win. Be yeah. as obnoxious as possible. And Kurt Angle like like was until he was literally out there thought they're going to cheer for him. Then he got out and everyone just booed the crap out of him because. Like they want to, they want to kick his butt, but they yeah. can't because he's a legit fighter, and he, like they, 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 like you know, like you get, you're, you get destroyed yeah. by him. But it's interesting because Stone Cold's actually a really great podcaster. He um, and he's very passionate about wrestling still, and like they're going through this match with him and Kurt and Shane McMahon, who's Vince's son, and they're just breaking breaking the match down. And you know, there's this move called a suplex, which is where you got the guy, you toss toss him over. It's a movie, yeah. it's a movie you see a million times, but because Kurt wasn't very familiar with it. He stick his legs out all the way that he yeah. should have, and he landed right in his tailbone and shattered it. Oh. So, like, they go into detail about how, like, you know, wrestling is fake. Uh, it's predetermined, obviously, but the littlest mistake you make can either cost you a huge injury or your opponent a huge injury. So yeah. he had to wrestle the rest of the match with a, a shattered tailbone. Oh. And then at another point, they had to break. Um, they, had a, they had a spot where he was going to suplex Shane through 
through like these through like these glass things on the sta- on the on the stadium. But the but the but the the glass was like was compacted, so like when the fireworks went off, like they would shatter immediately. Yeah. But they were too compacted, so when he suplexed Shane through it, he just bounced off it, landed like and landed backwards oh. on his head. And they kept the match going, and then they kept trying to throw him through, and he couldn't go through. And eventually, he broke it. But like Vince, who was backstage, like legitimately considered just ending, like canceling the match as it was, because they were first of all, Slim was basically getting killed out there, and Kurt was also like wrestling with a shattered tail- tailbone and everything. Jesus Christ! And it goes into more detail like later on how he Kurt was going to be in the Marine. He was going to be the Marine. <gasps> what? And he was excited because his body was. This is in mid two thousands, so he was going through his wrestling machine gimmick, where he was basically just like the guy who wrestles long matches and yeah. like basically murders his body to put on put on a good show. And um, so he's going to be in the ring. He's excited because he's like, oh, I'm going to get like six months off from wrestling because my body needs to heal. I'm going to do this movie, make good money from it. And I've been said, you know, we're going with, with John Cena. And it destroyed him. And he took like he took off his pants in front of Vince to show like the black and blue marks all around his crotch area saying like, I need a break. My body is just destroyed right now. Yeah. Um, Did he get a break? And- what did he get a break? Yeah, he got a bit of a break, but then soon after he he left WWE because like he had broken his neck another two times from wrestling, and he was like he was doing like these like he was just taking um, a lot of painkillers, a lot of sleeping medicine that was very Jesus. like an unhealthy amount of sleeping medicine. He said, he said to, to Stone Cold, he was basically just putting him in his mouth and chewing him and swallowing him. His body Jesus. was destroyed. He went to TNA for a while, but um, he said he suffered from like alcoholism and stuff, and you know antidepressants and things, and just went through a very tough time. But I guess redeemed him again because a couple of years ago he came back to WWE to get into the Hall of Fame and wrestled a few matches there. But um, it really like this is very fascinating because you know they talk about like the business side of wrestling where like you it's obviously fake and if you lose to a match in real life and to a guy you're not really worse than him you just it's just yeah like says but there's also the idea like you got to protect your gimmick and who you are you want to make the most money you got to start you got you can't lose because people aren't going to care about you so when you got a backstage politics you're like oh hey i don't want to lose to triple h tonight because blah 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 blah, blah. So it's like oh we're going to change that the script you're going to go over triple h instead and you know just like the things like that where it's all about making money he said, if Kurt says it really interesting, it's like you make money now so that when your body is messed up later, you have the money to pay for your own health, Ugh. which is a really fascinating way of looking at it. And, you yeah. know, everything ties back to the wrestler, the Darren Aronofsky movie we saw, where you're kind yeah. of addicted to that, to that, that pop when you come out, you know, being, you know, uh, uh, like a larger than life character and, and, you know, in the performance. But yeah. I'll stop talking about it there, but I found it to be very fascinating because they do a good job of, you know, talking about backstage stuff along with, like, what's your thought process in this match right now? Because a very good job of, like, going in-depth into wrestling, which I really, like, find interesting. Uh, that actually sounds really interesting. Uh, Mark yeah. looks so horribly bored, and he, he's typing and doing uh, something else. I could hear the keyboards uh, clacking. I'm not cl- – I'm doing something. Um, oh, my God. We got one more, so we Sorry. can – we can wrap this Sorry. up. Sorry. I actually, I, I was toiling between three movies. Uh, I was going to recommend Steve Jobs, the Danny Boyle 2015 one. Uh, and I didn't decide to go with that. I was going to recommend A Ghost Story from 2017. And I was like, I don't want to mm-hmm. go with that. Mm-hmm. I'm actually going to recommend uh, Eraserhead. David Lynch's Eraserhead. Uh, it was actually very coincidental because I wrote this down earlier. And then you were like, Blue Velvet. I was like, oh. I was like, oh, no. Um, the only the best way to describe this movie, and I won't talk about it too long because I really don't want to say much about this as, as much as I can. But I was very curious after watching this what people thought about it, and there was a review on Letterbox that really struck a chord with me, and it's basically saying like this is an impossible movie to grade because it just doesn't. It's not a conventional movie. It's an attempt to be. The the movie is how you take the movie to be. There is no, I guess in quotation marks, cohesive narrative in a sense. But it's really the movie dominated by its uh, allegories and themes and how you interpret the movie. And by that case, it's an impossible movie to grade because how do you grade a movie that's purposely not trying to play by the standards and be conventional or be a conventional movie? It's very much one that – it's like how do you grade like a painting or an art? And I'm not saying yeah. Eraserhead's art or it's a painting. It's uh, art. Mark is saying it's art. Uh, but I'm saying it's one of those movies that if you get something out of it, then the movie succeeds. If you, if you leave the movie and you go, I think that movie's about something, which I think it's about something. Uh, I I personally think it's about the destruction of the nuclear family. Nuclear mm-hmm. family. I think there's a lot of validity to that. But also, if you saw it and thought it was like it's not that at all, that's understandable. Uh, 
it has the David Lynch hallmarks that I, I know from what you guys talk about. It's very, very interesting, and it's visually very engaging. It's short and has a lot of like genuinely wonder st- wonderful stuff, and I want to recommend it solely because I'm curious to what people think because it's an impossible movie to grade. I don't give it a grade on Letterboxd. I don't think I ever could. It's but also that, a good movie for October. It is a good movie for October. I would that's, say it is. That's not a bad idea, Mark. Not a bad idea at all. Uh, yeah, that's uh, – that's our recommendations. That's five from each one of us with a little bit interruption in the middle, but it all should flow together because I'm an excellent editor. Uh, yeah, Matt, what's it's our gonna be like, It's going to be like we're talking. It's going to be something that's going to be hard cut. He's like, this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Matt, what's, what's our call to action? What are we doing? Uh, like, comment, episode? subscribe, comment for your phone fraud as long as it's me. Um, or me. Yeah, just so everyone knows, Jeffrey Davidson recommended that we watch North by Northwest, and we watched it. So if you have recommendations for us, leave them in the comments, and we will, we maybe will do it. Um, probably we will. We will, we will do it. We won't maybe do it. We will do it. We'll, we'll get to it know. eventually. I mean, we'll try. Yeah. Yeah. Film prize is, is, is hang on by a needle, by a thread. <laughs> Good, so, movies <laughs> Good movies only. Good movies only. Yeah. I'm not sitting yeah. and watching. So we're going like, to recommend epic movie or something like that. <laughs> we're like, all right, we'll just ban him from the channel. Yeah, yeah, but we do all those things. We're on iTunes, Spotify. Next week, Mark uh, recommends as part of his director series with Paul Thomas Anderson that we do the master. So be on the lookout for that. And then later on, we're doing five. To, what is it called? Uh, Trial of Chicago Seven or whatever. Trial of Chicago Seven, and then later on in the month, we're doing our October Halloween movie recommendations. So a lot of fun stuff. Yeah. For you guys to listen to. So you're welcome for that. Yeah, you're welcome. And, yeah, that's and um. Murphy says hi. Hi, Murphy. Hi, Murphy. Bye, Murphy. All right. Bye, Murphy. Thank you guys for watching, and I'm going to get the final word. Goodbye.